Thank you very much. Hi. Um, it's, of course, it's great still to be here, again to be here. And um, as the deacon said, I will, uh, today I will give my witness testimony and as time allows, perhaps talk a little bit more about um, the relationship of Judaism to the Catholic Church or maybe why. Boy, I, okay, I wasn't planning to start with preaching, but there's only one disadvantage that a cradle Catholic can conceivably have over a non-Catholic, which is uh, the danger of being a cradle Catholic is not being aware of what you have that no one else has. Um, and the advantage occasionally of being a convert is we as converts who come into the church from outside, it can be easier to see um, the infinite gift. Uh, well, it's easy even for a Catholic to see the infinite gift of the church, but what's harder to see is how everybody else is dying of thirst in the desert, essentially, except a Catholic who understands the truths of the faith and who, let's hope, is at least occasionally in a state of grace. So I will give my witness testimony, but um, maybe I'll talk more about that. But, but the point of my witness testimony is, uh, of course, having, uh, is talking about that transition a little bit. Anyway, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, I was born and raised quite Jewish. My parents were both German-Jewish Holocaust refugees. They had both fled Hitler's Germany. And uh, growing up, I grew up in the 50s, so it was pretty shortly after the war. Uh, Jews and uh, Gentiles, at least in the United States, I grew up outside of New York City. Um, that's why I'm speaking too fast, I'll slow down. But there was less mingling between Jews and Gentiles, and Jews and Christians, and um, growing up, uh, all, my, all my friends were Jewish, all my parents' friends were Jewish. Um, there wasn't really much interaction with, with Christians. Um, I went to a secular school, but from the beginning of school into university, I also went to Jewish religious education after school. And um, so uh, my entire identity was Jewish growing up, and the only way I could even conceive of God and religion was through Judaism. Um, I, um, in my late high school years, I became even more fanatically Jewish, one might say. I became a follower of a Hasidic rabbi. You know the Hasids with the long black coats and the ear curls? And I kind of fell under the spell of a very charismatic Hasidic rabbi and um, followed in his train and went to Israel the summer between high school and college, you know, following him around and, and um, uh, you know, being at his prayer meetings every night and so forth. And I even thought of not coming back to the United States to begin university that fall, but just staying in Israel and entering the closest thing Judaism has to religious life, which is a life of um, study and prayer in uh, yeshiva, in this case in, in Jerusalem. Um, it's a fairly monastic form of life. It's not exactly the same. But I didn't. I went back to the United States and I started university, which was MIT which is a very technical, scientific, um, you know, secular spirit university. And it's also a very prestigious university, so of course, you know, everyone there thinks that they're the smartest people in the world and know more than anyone else. And um, it was under that spell of that environment, I essentially lost my Jewish faith. The um, view of the world there was that religion is just some kind of you know, medieval superstition that man came up with to explain things before there was science to you know, really give the true explanation. And I fell under the sway of that pseudo-scientific worldview that science has all the answers and, and religion is just myth. It's actually a pseudo-scientific worldview. It's the opposite of a scientific worldview. Because the essence of science is you start with the data, you start with the evidence, you develop a theory that can explain the evidence. If it successfully explains the evidence, you can hold on to that theory. And if it can't explain the evidence, you have to throw it away and come up with another theory. The truth is that all of the evidence points to the truths of the Catholic faith. You have tons and tons of materialistic scientifically establishable evidence that supports Catholicism and that actually contradicts materialism. For instance, you have the Shroud of Turin. I think all of you know about the Shroud of Turin, uh, Jesus' burial cloth. 
And even today, you know, in, in 2015, with all of our technology, all of the engineers and scientists in the world could not counterfeit the Shroud of Turin, you know, much less 800 years ago, whenever it first came uh, to the surface. You have the Tilma of Guadalupe. Similarly, it's, it's on this uh, uh, cactus fiber cloth that has a lifetime of 20 or 30 years, and it is completely you know, undamaged and unworn after almost 500 years and so forth. You have the miracles of Fatima, right? The sun spinning in the sky and crashing to earth, which was seen by, you know, 80,000 or 100,000 people, including skeptics, including communists, including atheists, who had only gone there to laugh at these superstitious peasants who thought there'd be a miracle. You have the medical miracles at Lourdes and so forth and so on, right? You're all aware of that. But these, if one truly had a scientific worldview, one would have to say the theory of materialism fails because there's evidence to contradict it. Does this make sense? So anyway, but of course I didn't know this then. But um, it's a little bit of a digression, but uh, you know, we live in this very scientifically oriented age. I think that God gave us these physical miracles, especially today, like the Shroud of Turin and so forth, in part as a means of evangelization. So it's, it's a pretty, I think it's an effective means of evangelization. In other words, if somebody wants to be totally materialistic and claim that, they're, you know, that, that the faith is all nonsense, they should be challenged. Okay, how do you explain this? How do you explain this? And actually, all they can do is throw away the evidence. Basically, and Emile Zola, who was a very big French writer at the turn of the 20th century, an atheist, um, he went to Lourdes to uh, write a book debunking Lourdes, showing how it was all just you know, imaginary. Uh, he went there. He saw um, f tremendous physical miracles. There was a woman in the railway carriage going down with him whose face was eaten away by a cancer. And he saw her after she was healed and she had a healthy face. Well, you know what his response was? Was to pension her off, I think it was in Belgium for the rest of her life, so that, so that nobody could see her. Um, he wrote, I don't care how many miracles I see, I, I refuse to believe them. So anyway, that's the position that a that's, that's the scientific position, that's not very scientific. But anyway, I lost my faith at MIT. I went on to uh, Harvard Business School. I did well enough at Harvard Business School to be uh, invited to join the faculty. I joined the faculty, and at the ripe old age of 29, I was a professor of marketing at Harvard Business School, um, which was pretty heady stuff. But, what had, uh, but that's when the bottom fell out of my world, because what had been going on all my life since I was a small child was I felt in my heart there has to be a real meaning and purpose to life, and someday when I'm older, I'll come to know the real meaning and purpose to life, which I thought would come from entering into a personal relationship with God, which I honestly thought would happen at my bar mitzvah. The bar mitzvah is like the Jewish version of confirmation when the child is about 13. He uh, goes through this ceremony in the synagogue and enters religious adulthood. And I honestly thought that at my bar mitzvah, the veil would drop, and I would come into a personal relationship with God. And when that didn't happen, it was actually one of the saddest days of my childhood. But then pretty soon I decided the real meaning and purpose of life would come when I got a driver's license. <laughs> um, or when I left home, or when I started university, or if I got into Harvard Business School, and so forth. So I, I had for about 10 or 15 years these external objects that I thought would give my life real meaning. But here at the point I'm describing when I was 29, I was already far more successful in a worldly sense than I ever expected to be, being a professor at Harvard Business School, but life still had no meaning or purpose. You know, we were just a chemical accident, some lightning hit, some mud filled with amino acids, you know, five billion years ago, and here we are. Uh, there's no meaning or purpose to life. We live for 70 or 80 or 90 years and die, and that's it. There's no pattern to things that happen and so forth. So there was no point to anything despite the worldly success. And, but I, the difference being at this point, there was nothing more I could look forward to that I could imagine would give life meaning because you know, there was no brass ring out there to still reach for. So I fell into the uh, deepest despair of my life at that point, uh, a kind of existential despair. And it was in that, that I was walking in nature early one morning uh, just lost in my thoughts, that's the only solace I found would be to go to some beautiful place, you know, in the middle of nature. Uh, so I was just walking along, 
And I had long since, I mean, I was essentially an atheist at that point. I had long since um, given up on any idea of God or religion. And I received the most spectacular grace in my life. As I was walking along from one moment to the next, the curtain between earth and heaven disappeared. And I found myself in the presence of God, very knowingly in the presence of God, in a very intimate uh, uh, conversation with God, so to speak, seeing my life and experiencing my life as I would see it after I died and looked back over it in the presence of God. And I saw um, instantaneously, I saw how I would feel about everything after I died. I saw that my two greatest regrets when I died would be number one, all of the time and energy I had wasted worrying about not being loved, when every moment of my existence I was held in an ocean of love greater than I ever imagined could exist, coming from this all-knowing, all-loving God. And the other regret would be every hour I had wasted doing nothing of value in the eyes of heaven. Um, I saw my life as though, um, you know, all my life I had been greedily accumulating uh, piles of Monopoly money, you know, that brightly, papered, uh, brightly colored paper money from the game of Monopoly, when right next to it there was a stack of gold coins that I had been ignoring, which would be, of course, merit in heaven. I saw how foolish it was to be greedy for things that wouldn't be doing me any good at all, even a hundred years hence, you know, when I'm dead, whereas I could have been greedy, so to speak, to accumulate treasure in heaven, from which I would very literally be benefiting a hundred million years from now. Now, I know this isn't the healthiest attitude in the world, but I was a Harvard Business School marketing professor, so I have an excuse. You know, everything was net present value, everything was maximizing returns, and I was still seeing this a little bit in that way. So I, I didn't see the error in being greedy, I just saw how stupidly greedy I had been. And if I want to be smart and greedy, the only thing that made sense would be to try to be as great a saint as possible, essentially. Uh, another thing that I saw in this experience was how foolish I had been um, I had basically spent my life sort of looking in the rearview mirror, saying to myself, if only that hadn't happened to me, then I would be happy today, or if only that hadn't happened to me, then I would be happy today. And nothing could be further from the truth, because everything that had ever happened to me had been the most perfectly designed thing that could come to meet me, coming from the hands of this all-knowing, all-loving God not only including those things that had caused the most suffering at the time, but especially those things that had caused the most suffering at the time. And of course, I saw that um, the meaning and purpose of my life was to worship and serve my Lord and God and Master who was revealing himself to me. Now, I will say one other thing. Probably the biggest single transformative aspect of this experience was just coming into the incredibly intimate knowledge that God not only knew me personally, not only knew my, my name, but had been watching over me and caring about me every moment of my existence from my conception as though I were the only person he had ever created or ever would create. He not only knew and controlled everything that ever happened to me, but he knew how I felt at every moment of my life and cared about how I felt at every moment of my life. And um, in, a, in a fairly real way, was made happy by everything that made me happy and was saddened with me by everything that made me sad. And it was coming into this understanding of how intimately God knew me and how intimately he loved me and, and cared about me every moment. That was by far the biggest uh, transformative aspect of this. Now, um, I, I, you, one might ask, didn't you know that as a Jew? Um, now, in all honesty, if you read the Old Testament, that is not the picture of God you get. You get a little of it in the prophets, but you don't get any of it in the Torah, in the first five books of the Old Testament. The picture you get of God is the, like the picture you see in Exodus, when um, God calls Moses up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, he tells him, build a fence around the base of the mountain before you come up, because if anyone should even touch the base of the mountain while I'm on top, they will have to be instantly killed because of the sacrilege. So that's kind of the picture I had of God. Um, so it, obviously this was not fitting in with that picture, so I prayed, I, I could not think of this God as the God of Judaism, 
as the God of the Old Testament. So uh, as I, I was having this experience, I was actually still walking. It's a very curious, needless to say, state that I was in because I still saw the physical world around me, you know, the trees and the bushes and the insects, but I saw through it into the spiritual world. And the spiritual world was so much realer and so much more immediate and so much more concrete and substantial than the physical world that I wasn't surprised during this experience that I was seeing the spiritual world. The only thing I couldn't understand is how I could have ever not seen it because it was so much more real than the physical world, which was like you know, a painted veil, a kind of gossamer veil that was simply shielding one's vision from the real world. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but sometimes when you go to the theater or go to the ballet, you'll be in the audience and you'll be looking at the stage and there'll be a curtain on the stage and the lights will be on and you'll just see the front of the curtain and then they will turn off the house lights and there'll be a light shining on the front of the curtain and you'll still just see the curtain but then they will dim those lights and turn on the stage lights and all of a sudden you see through the curtain to the actors on the stage or the dancers on the stage and you barely see the curtain anymore and it was like that it was like like the physical world just became that you know very thin veil behind which I saw the spiritual world so um, I was walking along still and um, I prayed uh, to this God who was so incredibly present let me know your name so I know what religion to follow to worship and serve you properly I don't mind if you're Buddha and I have to become a Buddhist I don't mind if you're Krishna and I have to become Hindu I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan as long as you're not Christ and I have to become Christian and I very literally prayed that. And uh, God respected that prayer, Christ respected that prayer, and he didn't tell me who he was. Um, and I wasn't ready to hear it, obviously. But I went back home. Let me make a little bit of a digression that's a little bit related to the speakers yesterday morning, which is the picture that I have of the state that Jews are in with their resistance to Christ and their resistance to Christianity. Um, is sort of like the following, you know, parable or metaphor or something. Imagine a, a little boy with a, with a pet dog, and that dog just loves his little boy. The, the, the little boy is, you know, the, the moon and the stars and the sun to this dog. You know, the dog just like curls up under his chair all day waiting for him, you know, to come to the table or whatever. And the dog lives for this little boy. And then the little boy goes off to school and the dog is, you know, incredibly mournful and inconsolable. And the little boy grows up and he becomes like a teenager and he comes back home. And he uh, knocks on the door to come into the house and the little dog is going nuts, you know, barking at him and wants to tear him to pieces because he thinks that little boy, that now that young man, is invading and taking the place of the little boy who he wants to stay loyal to. Does that make sense? And that's kind of the state that I feel like I was in as a Jew because in a way the state that Jews are in is they're trying to stay loyal to to Christ actually to Christ as he revealed himself in the Old Testament and in the days of you know before he incarnated and out of their loyalty to Christ they're refusing to accept Christ it makes sense right but anyway that was all a digression back to the beach um, so I um, came out of this experience slowly over a period of hours, um, a little bit, I mean, in another sense, over a period of days. I went back home to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was living at the time, you know, as a Harvard professor. I couldn't care at all about teaching Harvard MBAs how to make a little more money anymore. All I wanted to do was pursue this experience and, um, and know, learn who this God was and how to worship and serve him properly. So um, I did some stupid things during that year because this had been a mystical experience and, and so I looked into some various forms of mysticism which were a very bad idea. But I did one smart thing, which is every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer that I had made up to learn the name of my Lord and Master and God who had revealed himself to me. Before, you know, I'd say this prayer just before going to sleep. And uh, a year to the day after that initial experience, and I know it was a year to the day because I prayed in Thanksgiving that day um, to before going to sleep. A year to the day after that first experience, I went to sleep and I thought I was awoken by a hand gently on my shoulder. 
and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. And I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, when I found myself in her presence, all I wanted to do was throw myself on my knees and somehow honor her appropriately. In fact, the first thought that crossed my mind was, oh my gosh, I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary, but I didn't. Now, I'll say a couple of things about uh, that initial part of that experience. First of all, I now understand my body was asleep in bed. I thought I was awake at the time. My memory represents it as though I were awake, but I understand that if there had been a camera in the room, it would have shown me asleep in bed. But anyway, um, when I found myself in her presence, I was just overwhelmed, overwhelmed, and uh, actually lifted into a state of ecstasy simply by the love that flowed from her. And as beautiful as she was to look at, even more uh, powerfully affecting was the sound of her voice. When she spoke, her voice was like what makes music music. It was like the essence of music. And it carried with it uh, a love that just flowed through all of my fibers and lifted me up into a state of ecstasy. And um, the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. Um, as I mentioned, uh, my first thought when I was in her presence was I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary so I could honor her appropriately. So when she offered to answer any questions I might have for her, I kind of wanted to ask her to teach me the Hail Mary, but I was too proud to admit that I didn't know it. So as a kind of indirect way, I, um, I said, what's your favorite prayer to you? Figuring she'd teach me the Hail Mary, right? Um, her first response was a little bit coy. It was, I love all prayers to me. But I was a little bit pushy. Maybe that's because I'm a New York Jew and maybe not. But I said, but you must love some prayers to you more than others. And she relented and she recited a prayer. Uh, but it was in Portuguese and I didn't know any Portuguese. So all I could do was make the effort to remember the first few syllables phonetically, and the next morning when I woke up, I wrote them down phonetically, and then later when I met a Portuguese Catholic woman, I asked her to recite all of the Marian prayers in Portuguese so I could try to identify it. And to the best of my ability, I identified it as, O oh Mary conceived without sin, pray for us, have recourse to thee. I'll mention maybe three or four of the other questions and answers. Uh, most of the questions were simply expressions of, um, I don't know how to put it, of, of, my, of my response to her presence, uh, which was, um, I, I'll go into the questions. It's, it's hard to describe, but, but I was absolutely overwhelmed. I, I, I knew that she was a, a, a human being, a person during this experience, but she was so glorious and so magnificent and so exalted that it was really hard to hold on to that thought that she was a human being. And in my defense, I will say that we know from, I believe it's the letter of John, when uh, an angel appeared to him, he threw himself on the ground and began to worship the angel until um, the angel said, get up, don't do that, that's not appropriate, I'm a creature like you. And we know that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the queen of angels, she's more exalted than the highest of the angels. So if that was the natural human response, to an angel, how much more so to the queen of angels. So most of my questions came out of that. So one of the questions I asked her was, um, in this state, I kind of stammered out, how is it possible, how can it be, how is it possible that you're so magnificent, that you're so exalted, that you're so glorious, how can it be? And she just looked down on me almost pityingly and she shook her head gently and she said, oh no, you don't understand, you don't understand anything. I'm a creature, I'm a created thing, he's everything. Um, and then um, another question I asked her, again out of this desire to somehow honor her appropriately, was I asked her what title she liked best for herself. And her response was, I am the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Spirit. And I will say that at the time I had this dream or this experience, I knew nothing about Christianity. I had never opened a New Testament, lest it pollute me. Um, I knew absolutely nothing about the Blessed Virgin Mary, except you know, from Christmas Carol, Silent Night, and from seeing Christmas crushes occasionally. All of this was entirely new to me. 
Um, the last question and answer I think that um, I'll mention is by now I figured out, obviously, that uh, if this is the Blessed Virgin Mary, it had been Christ on the beach, and it's all about Christianity, and I'd better get up to speed pretty quick. And all my life I had heard the expression, the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know what it meant. Um, so I asked her, and I apologize for the way I phrased it, but I didn't know any better. I said, what's this business about the Holy Spirit? And her response was simply to look upwards with an expression melting with love and say, he's his gaze. Um, many years later, when I told this story to some seminarians, they pointed out that St. Thomas Aquinas had called the Holy Spirit the look of love that passes between the Father and the Son. So um, I think that's probably all the questions and answers that are worth recounting. I asked some stupid ones, too. Um, and, uh, and then after I was finished with my questions, she said she had something she wanted to talk to me about, tell me. So she spoke for an, about another 10 or 15, maybe 20 minutes. And then the audience was over, and I went back to sleep. And the next morning when I woke up, I knew that it had been Christ on the beach. I um, wanted nothing other. I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. I knew her, her role, by the way, as a unique channel between heaven and earth that I knew from the experience. Um, and I knew I wanted to be as fully and completely a Christian as possible. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what the difference was between a Protestant and a Catholic. And so all I could really do was open a local phone book and go to a local church. It was a Protestant church. Uh, but I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. And when I got to know the pastor a little bit, I kind of shyly asked, what about the Blessed Virgin Mary? And when he answered, without the respect that I knew she deserved, I knew this is no place for me. And the other thing that was happening in those days was I was spending all of my free time hanging around Marian shrines. And there was a Marian shrine near my house to Our Lady of La Salette, which was an apparition in the French Alps in, I believe it was uh, 1846. It's a little bit like Fatima to a couple of shepherd children, uh, but it was a one-time apparition. And so there was a shrine to Our Lady of La Salette near my house, and I would drive up there three or four days a week just to walk the grounds and kind of commune with Mary. And of course, that was a Catholic shrine. And whenever I was at a Catholic shrine and there was a mass going on, I was filled with this tremendous desire to receive communion, even though I didn't know what it was. It was almost like a lust, you know, I want that, I want that, I want that. So um, basically, that's what led me to the Catholic Church pretty directly, was knowing who the Blessed Virgin Mary is and wanting to receive communion. Um, I will tell one story along the path. Um, I, I, uh, uh, you'll see why when I tell the story. So I, I, I had been hanging out at the shrine to La Salette. That winter, I went skiing in the French Alps, which was what I lived for, actually, before my conversion. And uh, the place where I was skiing, it rained for a couple of days. The skiing was pretty bad. Um, I looked on a map. It, was only, it looked like it was only an hour or two from La Salette, the real La Salette in France, the place where the apparition occurred. So I figured I'd take a day off of skiing and drive there. So I did that. Um, and by the time I got there, because of the mountain roads and so forth, it was the end of the day. It was sunset. La Salette is very high in the French Alps. It's miles and miles above the tree line. It is incredibly beautiful. It looks like Shangri-La. You leave the nearest village. You're winding, you know, the switchback road up the mountain. You leave the near last village, maybe about 10 kilometers behind. You leave the tree line. You know, it's all granite cliffs and snow bowls. And then when you get almost to the top of the mountain, there's a little hollow with this basilica. Incredibly beautiful. So I get to it. It's almost sundown. And I go in there and I ask, is it, I see a sign saying reception. So I go in there and I ask if it's possible to stay there. And they said, sure. So I stay there. I got stuck there for the whole ski trip because a blizzard moved in. The rain that was raining at the ski area was snow there. A blizzard moved in. I got stuck there for about 10 days. And um, by those 10 days, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary was working on me, essentially. I mean, I know that. I, I was sleeping most of the time. I had these very beautiful, delicious dreams and so forth. Um, and then. Um, and then on my way back, uh, back to the United States, finally the blizzard list lifted just in time for me to drive off the mountain. I was flying home from Geneva. I'm staying at a friend's apartment in Geneva, waiting for my flight the next morning. 
and I go to sleep, and just before going to sleep, I say a prayer, which is just complaining to God, as so many of our prayers are, and I say, I can't believe you did this to me. I go halfway around the world to go skiing, and you stick me at last let the whole time, you know? <laughs> and in the, after that, I fall asleep, and I wake into a dream where I'm confronted with this very serious, somber man but you could tell, you know what he reminded me of is like the high school teacher who is always very serious, but the kids know that he actually loves them more than all of the clappy happy teachers. So this very serious but loving man just is in front of me, he drills me with his eyes, and he says, you can go skiing or you can work for the second coming. It's your choice, which do you choose? So anyway, so then I go home and um, when I, I was dying to find someone to talk to about my mystical experiences, when I was at La Salette, um, there was another pilgrim there, an elderly French woman, and uh, after I got home, she called me up and she said, um, we think it would be a good idea if you check out the Carthusians. And um, I know, knew nothing about the Carthusians. I don't know how many of you know about the Carthusians. Have any of you seen the movie Integrate Silence? Or but the Carthusians are the strictest contemplative order in the church. They live in solitary confinement, essentially. They live in very strict silence. Uh, one meal a day that's brought to them uh, in a kind of uh, dumb waiter, so they don't even see the person who brings it to them. They, um, they're not allowed to talk at all. They, um, they break sleep every night. They, they sleep for about three hours from nine to midnight, and then they get up to chant matins until about 2.30 in the morning, and then they get to sleep about another three hours until they get up for mass. Very severe, silent, um, beautiful contemplative order. But I didn't know any, uh, much of this, so she, t she gives me the phone number of a Carthusian monastery near where she lives in France, and I call them up, and I say, uh, can I come and visit? Because when I heard about the Carthusians, I thought, if anyone's a mystic, these guys better be mystics, or else they'd be going nuts with such a you know, penitential life. So, Anyway, the guy who answers the phone, uh, he answered the phone, it turns out, because he was the prior. Uh, when I, I said, can I come and stay for a little while, he said, no, 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 absolutely not. We're strictly cloistered. We don't receive any visitors. But then he says, uh, tell me something about yourself. So I start telling him the story, and I can hear he's beginning to waver. So I say, should I send you a letter? And he said, good idea, send me a letter. So I send him a letter, and he immediately writes back, you're welcome any time. What I didn't know was the one exception to not receiving anybody is if it's a potential vocation. So, <laughs> so um, I'm still Jewish, I'm not baptized, I'm still anti-Catholic, but I get on a plane and fly to France and show up at this Carthusian monastery. And um, so I'm staying there, it was for about a week, and I'm, I'm staying in a cell and the prior is coming once a day, every day in the afternoon, to ask me if I have any questions or to give me spiritual direction. And every day, I'm saying to myself, I'm expecting him to give me a sales pitch about why I should become Catholic, right? So every day I'm expecting that when he shows up, today will be the day he gives me the sales pitch, but he doesn't, you know? And then, so he goes off after we talk, and I say, well, tomorrow, he's waiting till tomorrow to give me the sales pitch, but he still doesn't. So finally, I can't take the suspense anymore, and so when he comes, you know, that day, I kind of let him have it with both barrels, and I say, you know, aren't you going to tell me why I should become Catholic? And he said, oh no, not at all. All I ask is that you keep your eyes open and be honest with yourself about what you see. This overwhelmed me, because obviously he had faith in the Holy Spirit, and, you know, he knew it was the truth. Anyway, this is the last thing I was expecting as, if, excuse me for saying it, as a pushy Jew, you know. <laughs> so I'm telling, going to tell about three stories that happened there because that's really um, where most of my conversion took place, was at the Carthusian Monastery. So that's one thing that happened. Another thing that happened was I was joining the monks every night from, you know, midnight to 2.30 in the morning in their office, in, you know, it's chanting the Divine Office, which is, of course, are the Psalms from the Old Testament. So I'm getting up in the middle of the night, and I'm in this little stall, you know, next to all the monks on stalls to my left and my right, and they're chanting, Oh, Jerusalem, should I ever forget you? Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, you know? And, Oh, Zion, there's no place in the world as beautiful as you. And I'm looking around at all these old monks saying to myself, They're all wannabe Jews. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, and then the third thing that happened there was I'm working, uh, my job there was to cut grass in the orchard with this old scythe. So I'm out there scything the grass one day, and this elderly monk shuffles out to me, because since they're never allowed to speak, sometimes they like to take in a, you know, the opportunity. And so he shuffles out to me, and he says to me, um, may I ask you a question? And I say, sure. And he says, well, if you don't mind my asking, you're not Catholic, are you? Because they saw that I wasn't receiving communion at Mass. And I said, no, that's right, I'm not Catholic. And then he says, well then, if you don't mind my asking, uh, what are you then? And I say very proudly, I'm Jewish. And he said, oh, that's a relief. We were all afraid you were Protestant. So you can see, then I saw the, 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 the view that they had, which was that, that Jews are, as, as John Paul II, St. John Paul II said, our elder brothers in the faith. Protestants had the faith but rejected it, but Jews were in a different category. Um, and the third thing that happened there, and maybe the most important thing that happened there, was I felt the presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary there. I would have thought, as, you know, a materialist or whatever, that these monks would be very, would be sourpusses, they would be bitter, they would be unhappy. Here they lived this incredibly penitential life. You know, they had no pleasures, right? They had no comfort, they had no sleep. <laughs> and, um, but instead, they were, they were joyful, you know, like kindergartners sharing a joke, you know. Many of them looked like they were, you know, kind of had a sig secret giggle going on behind their faces. And I knew that what filled them with that love and that filled them with that warmth was the presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I don't know the correct theology to describe this, but when I was there, I felt the way that the Blessed Virgin Mary animates the spirit of the Catholic Church. It's like the Catholic Church is the external building and the Blessed Virgin Mary is the heart of it. And I felt that there. So by the time I left there, Uh, by the time I left there, I wanted to become Catholic. Um, it still took me a few years for various reasons, um, but uh, I, I, a couple of, it took me a couple of years to be baptized. Um, the, the, some of the places I went were a little bit confused. But anyway, uh, and of course, that was the biggest thing in my life. And uh, since my baptism, and please don't applaud this, this has nothing to do with me, but um, since my baptism, which was in 1992, so once I make it 22 years ago, I honestly don't think I went more than a dozen days without receiving communion, and usually when I was traveling. Um, and the only reason is because I'm still, again, excuse me for saying this, I'm, I'm still that Harvard Business School marketing professor, I'm still greedy, and given what communion is, and given the fact that we live for all eternity, and our eternity is entirely dependent on this little period of 60 or 70 or 80 years of life on earth. And um, I'm not sure what we receive when we receive Holy Communion, but um, it's probably going to matter for all eternity. And it's probably going to be a plus for all eternity. And that's uh, not a good reason, it's a greedy reason, but it's still a reason to want to receive Communion every day. Um, and uh, I saw in the few minutes I have left, I actually don't know how many minutes I have left. Uh, let me just talk. I, I, it's what I started out saying, is, is the only advantage of not being born Catholic is, is um, you know, if you live your life in this desert, if you think life has no meaning and so forth, um, you, I mean, how can, how, can, how can anything be more important than your eternity? And we know from the saints that, um, it's not a matter of just getting to heaven like tomorrow when I fly home I'll get on the airplane and as long as I'm on the airplane I'll arrive in the United States at the same time as everyone else. It's not just getting into the airplane getting into heaven. You know, there's a first class cabin and there's a business class cabin. Um, you know, and there's, there's sitting by the lavatory at the rear of the plane, you know. So you've got to be on, uh, there for all eternity. What matters more? The, the only um, point of life on earth is getting to heaven and getting other people to heaven. Um, everything else is, is a means to an end. So let me read a quote. I assume I only have about three minutes left. Um, I had books out there. I've, I'm sold out, thank you very much. So I can't be accused of trying to peddle books. But uh, one of the books is called Honey from the Rock. 
and it's a, it's a collection of 16 Catholic Jewish witness testimonies. I'm going to read a passage from one of the other Jews who entered the Catholic Church who are in that book. His name was Charlie Rich. He was a Hasidic Jew, right, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, who when he lost his Jewish faith uh, tried to commit suicide because life had no meaning. And he, um, after an unsuccessful suicide attempt, he walked in, this is 1950, so it's before air conditioning. It's New York City, it's a hot summer day. He walked into an empty Catholic church just to get out of the heat. He sat down under a stained glass window of Jesus stilling the waters. Um, he said to himself, oh, if only it were true. And he hears this voice saying, it is all true. <laughs> so, um, and so let me read, and he spent the rest of his life, he was in about 30 at the time that this happened, and he died relatively recently, uh, uh, he died in uh, 1998. At the age of 99, he spent the rest of his life as a contemplative with the Jesuit community in New York, praying before the Blessed Sacrament 12 or 14 hours a day. So let me just read some words of his to close. And as I read these words, think of it as an exhortation for you to evangelize. Because again, nobody else has what a Catholic has. Nobody else has the graces a Catholic has. No one, no one else, you know, it's, 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 it, we have no idea and we won't know until we die what we have that no one else has. But we will be called to account for sharing it and for helping others as much as we can. You know that parable in the Gospels about Lazarus and the rich man, right? And it's usually thought of in terms of worldly goods. You know, the rich man is feasting at a table with food falling on the floor, and there's a starving beggar outside of the door, and he won't even give him a crumb. Well, it, you can also see it spiritually, okay? And you are all the rich man feasting at the table, and everyone else, I mean every non-Catholic, is that starving beggar outside the door. And we are going to be just as responsible for what we've done to share our wealth with him or her as the rich man was about not sharing his food, right? So anyway, so let me read, close with these words of uh, Charlie Rich, and then uh, maybe another prayer for the conversion of the Jews. Um, I have since my baptism and First Communion, acquired a happiness which I would not exchange for anything in the world. It has given me a peace of mind and a serenity of outlook which I did not think was possible on this earth. It would have been in vain to have been born had God not been good enough to extend me the grace to become a member of the mystical body of Christ, the Church of Rome is. Without the life Christ is, there is no life at all. Um, uh, it, is to, it is for heaven we have been made and for no other earthly good thing. It is to heaven every good and beautiful experience points and has in view. I became a Catholic so that I may in that way be happy, not just for a few years, but forever and ever. I became a Catholic that I may in that way get the grace to one day participate in the joys of the angels and saints in the life to come. It is to that life the grace of conversion is meant to lead. It is meant to lead to a happiness we cannot now imagine or conceive. One can never come to an end of enumerating the blessings conferred upon one by the grace of being a Catholic. It is being a Catholic that matters and not any other thing the world has to offer, however good and beautiful it may be. The Church of Rome gives us God himself. It does so in all his fullness a greater gift than God is, a human being cannot hope to receive. We receive the gift God himself is when we receive Holy Communion. It is to the church we must go to have God in the fullness he may be experienced this side of heaven, to become more intimately united with God than the church enables us to be by means of the Holy Sacraments. We must take leave of this life. Amen. Amen. So let <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, um, so let me close with another prayer, another totally kosher prayer for the conversion of the Jews. Um, and let me just say, uh, I don't have prayer cards with this prayer on. I have a website. Uh, guess what its name is? Salvationisfromthejews.com. And um, I have everything up on my website. Uh, actually, everything 
free, accept the books for free, and you can order the books through the website too. But um, the, uh, I have all the odd, tons of audio and video and everything up on the website, and I have these prayers up on the website too. So this is a prayer for the conversion of the Jews from the Catholic breviary for the week of Christian unity in January. Um, day six or seven of the, I guess day six of the week for Christian unity is dedicated to prayer for the conversion of the Jews. Um, in full disclosure, this is the old form of the breviary. I think they've watered down the prayer. Maybe, I'm not going to say why, but it's, nonetheless, it's from the Catholic breviary for the week of Christian unity. And here's the prayer. And uh, again, I invite you uh, to pray along and, and maybe to, to think about the prayer. O oh God, who manifests your mercy and compassion towards all peoples, have mercy upon the Jewish race from the beginning, your chosen people. You selected them alone out of all the nations of the world to be the custodians of your sacred teachings. From them, you raised up prophets and patriarchs to announce the coming of the Redeemer. You willed that your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, should be a Jew according to the flesh, born of a Jewish maiden in the land of promise. Listen to the prayers we offer you today for the conversion of the Jewish people. Grant that they may come safely to a knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah foretold by their prophets, and that they may walk with us in the way of salvation. Amen. Amen and thank you.